Well, welcome everybody. I'm very, very pleased that so many people are here today. I'm Arthur Kissner, the librarian of the Fitchburg Public Library. And uh, I suppose I'm the host of the occasion here, but I didn't really do any of the work. Uh, as some of you may know, uh, this is part of a series of ethnic heritage programs uh, known as the Fitchburg Mosaic. In fact, this is the seventh program in the Scholars series. And all the, although the Armenian community is perhaps one of the smallest groups in terms of size in the community, as you can see, the committee that's been organized to plan this program has done a fantastic job in generating interest so that we've had to move in some more seats uh, for this occasion today. And all the work uh, has been done by the committee uh, for this particular program and also for the second part of the project, which involves a slide program about the Armenian culture. And the committee will be working with Gunther Hus, who's doing the videotape today on that program sometime later on this year and next year. And we hope you join us for the showing of that presentation. And so it's a great deal of pleasure to me to turn this program over to the person who has headed up the local committee, person that all of you know, I'm sure, very capable person. And she will take the program from here, Anna McCallion. Anna? Thank you for coming. I hope you'll enjoy our program. I'm not, I'm not much of a speech maker, so I'll introduce our next speaker, Dr. Granger Browning, who's a professor at the Fitchburg State College, and he has done a lot of work. Mrs. McCallion and members of the Armenian American Committee, and a very good, pleasant afternoon to this very lovely audience. I say we are pleased indeed to have so many more colors come into the mosaic, and also to recognize so many more young people uh, come being a part of this portrait. I have some good news and some bad news for you this afternoon. First, the, the bad news. This, as you know, is a crazy world. Choose any section of it, and you will find misunderstanding and conflict. Whether it's in the family, the economy, the Protestants and Catholics of Ireland, the, I guess, Jews and Arabs in the Middle East, or the blacks and whites in Boston. Even Violence has erupted in that small, beautiful space that we call Armenia. That is the, the bad news. The good news is that with, within this crazy world, there are pockets of sanity. And this place, the Fitchburg Public Library, and this program, the Fitchburg Mosaic, constitute one of those pockets whose central theme is knowledge of self and appreciation of others. And knowledge and appreciation are enhanced with the involvement of scholars. And I shall introduce you now, introduce to you one of the best. Dr. James Ekmekian has been honored both at home and abroad for his scholarship. He is listed in Who is Who in American Education and also in the International Registry of Who is Who. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree and Master of Arts degree at Harvard University and his Doctorate of Philosophy from Brown University. He has taught in some of the finest institutions of higher learning in this country, including the University of Southern Illinois, Queens College, and Michigan State University. He currently is the lecturer in Armenian Studies at Boston University and is highly recognized as, as an authority in the literature and language of the Armenian, French, and Spanish cultures. So you see, it is with pride and with pleasure that I present to you at this time the scholar of the afternoon, Dr. James Edmechian.
Thank you, Dr. Browning. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to be here to participate in this quest for knowledge of ourselves and appreciation of one another, perhaps in the greatest laboratory that the world has ever seen, in which peoples from so many different areas in the world with such diverse backgrounds have come together to forge a society based upon democratic principles where free interplay of cultures and values is an accepted principle, if sometimes not always successful. The history of a people is one of the most important elements in understanding the people because peoples do not exist in a vacuum. They are the products of centuries of traditions and experiences. Now, if I were to give you an even bird's eye view of 3,000 years of Armenian history, I would need much more than the cruelly limited few minutes that are at my disposal. Therefore, we're going to have to fly and fly very fast in 20th century manner, perhaps at the speed of a shooting star, over the early centuries, emphasizing the modern aspects of Armenian history, and especially that aspect which concerns the immigration of Armenians and their settlement in the United States, especially in Fitchburg. What you see on the blackboard is not an inept version of a surrealist painting, uh, but it is the world's worst artist's conception of geography. Limited, or perhaps aided and abetted, by a limited blackboard which has distorted an even earlier distortion. The, this thing that you see here is supposed to represent what has been called historically the, uh, I guess I have to get used to the microphone, uh, historically the Armenian Plateau. The Armenian Plateau is located southeast of the Black Sea, west of the Caspian, south of the Caucasus Mountains, mostly east of the Euphrates River, and north of the Taurus Mountains. This portion of that mountain chain is uh, called also the Carduchin Mountains. N as you can see, this is a very important area historically and geographically because it represents not only a bridge between east and west, but also a crossroads of civilization. This is the area which would-be conquerors from the east and the west had to cross in order to reach one another. The Persians, who have been centuries-old uh, neighbors, in fighting, the Greeks had to cross the Armenian Plateau. The Greeks had to do the reverse in order to fight the Persians if they wished to fight them on their own land or on some land other than uh, Greece. The Romans and the Byzantines and others followed the same route. Invaders from the north have come down frequently in earlier and later times, just as invaders from the south, the Arabs and others, have uh, moved to the north. Now, not only then has this been a bridge and a battleground for armies, but it has also been a battleground for cultures, where varying cultures, the Eastern and the Western cultures, have battled one another for the very spiritual and intellectual life of the Armenians. Now, throughout history, therefore, 
Armenians have had political organizations, sometimes stronger than others. But they have always had to contend with outside forces which invariably invaded upon their own lives and threatened to swallow them. One would never have guessed that six centuries of royal power from the second century BC to the uh, fourth, fifth century after Christ, there would have been an Armenian political power on the Armenian plateau. And yet four centuries after this event, the abolition of the Armenian royalty, little Armenian kingdoms sprang up in the Middle Ages. They lasted for two centuries to be followed by another Armenian kingdom, this time on foreign soil in this particular area, in Cilicia, where many of them had either migrated or been forced to migrate because the Byzantines wished to depopulate Armenia uh, in order to make it uh, more feasible for them to control Armenia, and because the Seljuk Turks were uh, had invaded Asia Minor and uh, had brought tremendous pressure both on the Byzantine Empire and the Armenians. And on that foreign soil, Armenian nobles declared independence and they brought forth a kingdom that was able to last for three centuries and constituted one of the brightest spots in Armenian political and cultural history. With the triumph of the Turks and helped by the Egyptian Mamluks in the 14th century, Armenian political power disappeared completely. And for centuries, for many centuries, after the conquest of Constantinople by the Ottomans, the Armenians and many Christian minorities lived in a state of semi-servitude in cultural darkness with few dim lights burning in the monasteries where the monks preserved Armenian culture just as in the West they had done in the catacombs of Rome. Fortunately, in the 19th century, due to pressures from Western powers who were being asked and who were interested in helping Ottoman Turkey against Russian advances in Eastern Europe. I say, at that, fortunately at that time, due to this pressure, pressure because they felt that they could not help Turkey, given the Ottoman Empire's record vis-a-vis -vis the, the Christians in their empire, they felt that they needed favorable public opinion at home in order to justify themselves in helping the Ottoman Empire against uh, Russian Tsarist advances. The result was that the Ottoman Empire promulgated two decrees in 1839 and 1856 whereby the Sultan guaranteed the security of life, honor, and uh, property, promised equality before the law, promised equal taxation, and a number of other basic reforms. Now the reforms were more successful in Constantinople than they were in the provinces where there was considerable foot dragging on the part of the local authorities. And the farther away the province, the less likely it was that the reform decree, decrees were going to be implemented. Constantinople was something else again because the Sultan, of the Sultan's presence and because also of the presence of the foreign ambassadors. And it was during this period of some 40 to 50 years that droves of Armenian students went to Western Europe to study in 
universities to study such things as uh, law, medicine, agriculture, business, to come back to help their people advance from the pitiful state in which they had been for centuries. They brought back the liberal ideas that had been born during the French Revolution. They brought back new ways of governing. In other words, here they were, they had seen uh, the democratic process at work in Western Europe, as limited as it was. They brought back ideas about revising or uh, remodeling their own national administration, a national administration within the uh, Turkish government with the patriarch at the head. And this national government reflected the autocratic government of the, of the sultans. They brought back new ideas about literature. And within the period of four or more decades, they were able to forge the Armenian vernacular into an effective literary vehicle they were able to establish a uh, network of parochial schools that extended from the wealthiest suburb in Constantinople to the remotest villages in the, in the provinces. They made the people conscious and proud of their past. But then, as all good things must come to an end, these things also came to an end much too quickly. And the turning point was the accession of Sultan Abdul Hamid II to the Ottoman throne in 1876. At that time, Turkey was working under a liberal constitution, but uh, soon, uh, under uh, pretext of uh, war conditions, the Sultan abrogated the constitution, he, re he prorogued uh, parliament, and embarked upon his very tight and stifling uh, government of the Ottoman Empire. Liberal Turks suffered with uh, Christian minorities, with the Jews and others. And gradually, as the reign tightened, the little freedom that had been achieved began to disappear. And now there was a different mentality which was born and was being developed by not only Abdul Hamid, but, but also by the younger Turkish students who were now attending the secondary schools. You see, by the end of the 19th century, Turkey had lost most of its empire in Eastern Europe, in North Africa, and it was in danger of losing more and more. And in order to compensate for this, someone, perhaps a group of people, conceived the idea of forging a pan-Turanian empire, the Turanians being relatives of the Turks. And this empire was to extend from Asia Minor to Central Asia. Now, the Armenians, on their 3,000-year homeland, constituted a foreign, quote, unquote, element. And they had to be dealt with, either through Islamization or failing that, they had to be liquidated. Islamization was out of the question. The Armenians had shown that historically over and over again. Therefore, the alternative was liquidation. The liquidation did not come during Sultan Hamid's uh, regime. However, it started at that time because as uh, Sultan Hamid became more and more despotic, Armenian political parties were formed, uh, demonstrations and violence took place in the 1890s, followed by the massacre of some 300,000 Armenians between 1894 and 1896. Although after the deposition of Sultan Hamid in 1909 and the coming into power of the Young Turks, there seemed to be a ray of hope for a more democratic administration where the Turk and the Armenian could live to together, this was all brought to naught by the First World War when the Young Turks, taking advantage of the breaking uh, out of the hostilities, decided to put their uh,
program of genocide uh, against the Armenians. Uh, I don't need to go into the gruesome details. Many of you know the details. Let me just say, to, to give you an idea, that those of you who, have, who remember or who have heard about the infamous March on Bataan in the Second World War, where 35,000 American soldiers were involved, and many of them died of hunger, torture, and thirst. Multiply that by 40-fold. Substitute old men, women, and children for the soldiers, and use your imagination a little bit to see what might have taken place and you have a pretty accurate idea of what happened to a million and a half Armenians, or namely three quarters of the population of uh, uh, Turkish Armenia and Turkey during the 1915-18 genocide. Uh, political thing, uh, circumstances changed. And unexpectedly, a few years later, another Armenia was born, and that Armenia is this. as opposed to this. And that is the portion that now forms part of the Soviet system. It is called the Armenian Soviet Socialist Republic. It has a population of four million people uh, where the Armenian language is used in school, on the streets, in literature, in research, scientific and historical research. Considerable uh, material progress has been made since 1920, without any question, and yet a great deal remains to be done. Present-day Armenia is neither a hell or a heaven or paradise, but the darkest days of the Stalinist era seem to be behind, and both the people in Armenia and in uh, the diaspora hope that the future will have uh, better things for it. Now today, we are interested especially in the Armenians who have come to the United States from the land of Ararad to the land of Washington, if you will. Armenian emigration has not been a recent phenomenon. Merchants have been plying the trade routes in the Middle East for many, many centuries. They have even established residence in widely separated places, in such widely separated places as Holland, Italy, India, uh, the Far East, so on. And they migrated very often under duress, as I indicated earlier, and later, after the 11th century, after the advent of the Turks, more voluntarily seeking security and happiness elsewhere. So although the arrival of a handful of Armenian adventurers with Captain John Smith in 1607 in Virginia was a new experience because this was a totally new land and so far removed from Armenia, it was not contrary to Armenian tradition. Now 12 years later, this little band was joined by the legendary Martin the Armenian, who happened to be on the staff of Governor Yardley, but who, after he had achieved the status of free man, or citizen of the Virginia colony, decided to strike out on his own and become a tobacco grower. Who, after his first crop, he decided to go to England to sell his wares, because he preferred to work for himself rather than for someone else. But he had not counted uh, upon the, uh, uh, the customs people at the English port where he landed, who insisted on imposing the so-called foreigner impost, which was much heavier than the duty imposed on uh, British subjects. Martin objected. He appealed to the law. The British court ruled in his favor. and. His uh, naturalization trial became the first uh, uh, citizenship trial which established the principle that a non-Englishman could become uh, an English citizen and open the Virginia colony to non-English people as well. 
we have to wait more than two centuries before we find any kind of uh, immigration, even a ripple toward America, and that is in the latter half of the 19th century. But even by 1889, there, it is said that there were only about 700 Armenians in the United States scattered throughout Worcester, Boston, uh, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey. And 1889 is the date when the uh, Fitchburg Armenian community is said to have been born, when a handful of Armenians came from Worcester to establish here, and most of them apparently sought employment at the Ivor Johnson Arms and Cycle Works. They inhabited the Federal Street area, which was appropriately christened uh, Little Armenia. Uh, although uh, many of them, many of this little group, worked in industry, eventually some of them decided, like Martin the Armenian, to strike out on their own. So they opened their little shops, barber shops, tailor shops, cobbler shops, and so on, sometimes without knowing much about the trade that, that they were going into, but they learned through experience. Uh, and then, as, as things have changed, as the Armenians have had greater opportunity, both here and elsewhere, they, they have branched out into different areas, into the professions, law, medicine, uh, teaching, uh, and others as well. Now, the Fitchburg community represents the microcosm of the general picture that exists throughout the, in the United States. The things have changed, but there are certain values that have remained with the Armenians. Manners have changed as they do. They are part and parcel of the society in which they live. But certain values have remained. And one of these values, or perhaps two of them, indicate characteristics of the Armenians. And this has been goal orientation and industriousness. When they came, whether they were students or people seeking economic advancement or flight from Turkish persecution, they came here to achieve their goal no matter what it took to achieve it. A student was not afraid to work long hours to burn the gas jet in, and to study in dimly lighted rooms until midnight or early in the morning in order to get a college education. The businessman who had struck out on his own was willing to put in even longer hours than he had put before burning furnaces in the factory in order to succeed. And in spite of all changes, these two characteristics have remained with the Armenians in this country and elsewhere. Armenians have been by and large law-abiding and loyal to the country in which they live. Police statistics compiled over decades indicate that in relation to their numbers, the number of arrests among Armenians is the lowest among the different groups or near the bottom. Uh, the Armenian has not been in the forefront of the union movement nor has he been a political animal. To him, the preservation of cultural, ethnic, and spiritual values has been just as important as economic and political success. It is for this reason when a little group of Armenians get together, the first thing they do establish is to establish a little association, then an Armenian school, and then a parish and eventually a church of their own. Because the Armenian church has been the guardian of the spiritual and cultural values of the people throughout the centuries. From the moment the Armenians accepted Christianity as the state religion in the fourth century AD. And throughout the remote parts of the world, you will find little Armenian churches where communities, Armenian communities, have disappeared long since. 
and the Armenian Protestants and the Armenian Catholics have not had the urgency to build their church uh, the way the members of the Armenian church have had to because they have been able to get the spiritual satisfaction in comparable non-Armenian churches. However, they too, eventually, when they are economically in a position to do so, to, they, they also build their own houses of worship. As far as advancement politically in this country is concerned, the highest appointive office achieved by an Armenian in the United States has been that of Under Secretary of State. The highest elective office has been uh, that of Congressman. There have been mayors, city managers, at attorneys general, legislators, and now candidates for governorship. But the process of becoming involved in this uh, democratic uh, way of life has been rather slow. However, as they achieve success, they most certainly make a significant contribution to the life and welfare of America as they have done in every country where they have had the opportunity to rise to responsible public positions. As hyphenated Americans, are we not all hyphenated Americans? Fully aware and proud of the best that their traditions have to offer, but fully integrated into American life and participating constructively in the democratic process, they cannot fail to bring a unique and enriching element into the mosaic of American life. I join the Armenian community in congratulating you and thanking you for having undertaken such a project and for having given me an opportunity to share my thoughts with you on this very important matter, important to us Americans all.